Today we're going to continue with calculating the electric potential. Um, yesterday we learned how to do this for capacitors and for the area around point charges. Um, but today we're going to learn how to do that for a charged sphere. We're going to apply that to atoms to learn how to calculate ionization energy for electrons. And then we're also going to apply it to uh, multiple source charges. So the first one we're going to look at is the electric potential of a charged sphere which is actually super, super similar to a point charge. The only difference between this and a point charge um, is really that this has a piecewise function, and we'll talk about that right now. So if you remember back in um, statics when we were talking about um, conductors, you'd remember that on a sphere, all of the charge, we'll call this one positive, all of the charge spreads out over the surface of the sphere. And due to Gauss's law, the field inside the sphere equals zero. And since there is no field inside the conductor, um, that's going to mean that the potential everywhere inside the conductor is zero. So if you're looking at a sphere with radius capital R, Anywhere inside that sphere from 0 to R is going to be, or is going to have a potential of 0. And that's represented by the first line of the piecewise function right here. Side note, and I'm going to go fix this for class um, tomorrow, but it would take me a few minutes to redo this video and re-import it, so I'm not going to fix it right now. But I will tell you is I messed up all these little X's right here should be lowercase r's. And that little r is representative of how far away from the center you are measuring the potential. So if we wanted to measure the potential with r inside the sphere, where little r is less than big R, that potential is zero. Now, if we go to the edge of the sphere where r, little r, is equal to big R, that's going to have a potential because there is charge there. And we're going to name that potential or call that potential V0. So that is simply just going to mean the potential on the edge of the sphere. And to calculate V sub 0, you can use... But it's basically the equation for a point charge. So due to Gauss's law and some weird mathematical voodoo, and I never explain the mathematical voodoo, if you are not inside the sphere, if you're on the edge or further, if you're measuring potential on the edge or further, you can just pretend that all of the charge that's located on the surface, you can just pretend that it's all right in the middle, localized at the center of the sphere, like a point charge. And the math works out the same way. So, to find this V sub zero, the potential on the charge, you have to do KQ over R, which was the potential for a point charge we learned yesterday. But right on the edge of the sphere, R is equal to R. So your potential at the surface equals K, 9 times 10 to the 9, times Q, the total charge on the sphere, divided by R, the radius of the sphere. So that's how you get V0. And for any radius that falls outside of the sphere, you calculate it just like you would a point charge using this equation down here on the bottom, kq over r, r being the radius to the point where um, you're measuring. Now, if you're only given the voltage, or the, sorry, the potential at the edge of the sphere on the surface and the radius of the sphere, and you need to find the potential at some point r, you can use this other part of the equation, which is basically a mathematical reworking of the previous thing. So we said um, V sub naught equals KQ over capital R. And if we need to find KQ over R, 
but we don't have Q, we could multiply KQ over big R times big R over little r to get the same thing because those r's will cancel. And kq over big R is the same as b sub naught. So to get the potential at any point outside of the sphere, you could also use the um, voltage at the surface times the radius of the sphere over the radius to the point that you're trying to measure. Really, if you're outside the sphere or right on the edge, it works exactly like a point charge. If you're inside the sphere, the potential is simply zero. And now we have assumed here that this is a conducting sphere, um, like something made of metal where all the charge resides along the outside. If it is an insulating sphere where the charge lies throughout the sphere, that's a different thing. We're not going to worry about the inside of the sphere if it is not conducting. So let's look at this example real quick. It says a proton is fired from far away towards the nucleus of an iron atom, which we can model as a sphere containing 26 protons. The diameter of the nucleus is 9 times 10 to the negative 15th meters. What initial speed does the proton need to just reach the surface of the nucleus? Assume the nucleus remains at rest. So let me draw a picture of this real quick so we know what's going on. It's important to note here that the sphere we're looking at is just the nucleus, not an entire atom, it's just the nucleus, and it's got a charge of 26 times the fundamental charge because it's 26 protons. So Q equals 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs times 26. And of course, we have that the diameter of the nucleus is 9.0 times 10 to the negative 15th, which means the radius of the nucleus, which is our sphere, equals 4.5 times 10 to the negative 15th meters. Got to divide it by 2 because it was a diameter. All right, so we're looking for the initial speed of the proton if it's going to just reach the surface of the nucleus. So it's starting far away from the nucleus way out here. And far away the potential is going to be zero because if you do k q over r and r is really really big then it's going to become zero effectively so we're going to say at this point way out here the potential is zero and we're going to have to push this proton all the way from out here to the surface so that's going to create some potential difference, delta V, going from V equals 0 to V equals whatever we figure out that it is. And if we do potential difference times Q charge, we'll get delta U, which will be negative delta K. And from that, we can figure out the speed. So the first thing and the biggest deal we have to calculate is the... Um, potential on the edge of the sphere. And the potential on the edge of the sphere, if you remember from the previous slide, equals K, which is just a constant, times Q, the charge, which we have written up here. I'm going to make that an arrow so it doesn't look like a negative. We've written it up there, over R, which is capital R, for the surface. So that's going to equal 9 times 10 to the 9 newtons times meter squared over coulomb squared times q i'm running out of room to write got to make everything smaller again times q which is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 uh, coulombs and that's times 26 because there's 26 of these protons so all of that right there is q and divide that by the radius 4.5 times 10 to the negative 15. I'm going to go type that into a calculator, crunch it out real quick, and let you know what I get. So if you type all that in, it's going to get you um, that your potential on the sphere is 8.33 times 10 to the 6th. And that is measured in joules 
per coulomb, which is the same thing as volts. So what we've got here is a proton that is going from a potential of zero to a potential of 8.33 times 10 to the six, which makes the potential difference equal to 8.33 times 10 to the six minus zero, which is simply 8.33 times 10 to the six joules over coulombs. And we know that potential difference times Q, the charge of the object that we're moving through space, is equal to the change in potential energy. So what we've got to do is take this potential right here, the potential difference, and multiply it by Q, which is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs for our proton that we're firing. Multiply those two things together, which is Q times delta V, which will get us the change in potential energy. Crunching that out gives you a change in potential energy of 1.33 times 10 to the negative 12th, and that is joules. So the change in potential energy, and potential energy is increasing here as we push a positive closer to another positive, is going to make your kinetic energy decrease. So your change in potential or sorry, change in potential energy is equal to negative change in kinetic energy. And our change in kinetic energy is going to be going from a maximum kinetic energy um, at the beginning to zero kinetic energy because it stops just on the surface. So we can find our speed by finding this change in kinetic energy, which we already know is equal to that number. And once again, I've run out of room, so got to consolidate, make this a little bit smaller again. So now what we're going to do is take this 1.33 times 10 to the negative 12th joules and make that equal to the kinetic energy at the beginning because of conservation. And the kinetic energy at the beginning was 1 half m, which is mass of a proton, times velocity squared. Now I've got to go find the mass of a proton real quick. Um, so I'll do 1 half mass of a proton is... 1.673 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms times v squared, that initial speed velocity is what we're looking for, equals 1.33 times 10 to the negative 12th joules. Sorry, kind of swapped sides there a little bit. It's fine. And now we just solve this for v by dividing both sides by that mass. So divided by 1.673 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, divided by 1.673 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, and multiplying each side by two to get V squared. Then to get V by itself, we'll take the square root. And for that, you get 3.99 times 10 to the seventh meters per second. So that's like a little over 10% of the speed of light, which is moving pretty quick. All right, next up we have ionization energy. And ionization energy basically uses the same concept we were just working on. The model is of um, an atom, which we're gonna just consider as a sphere. And the radius of that sphere is equal to the radius of the atom. And an electron, is hanging out on the surface of that sphere where we can easily calculate the potential. So what we need to do is find the amount of energy that's needed to move an electron from the surface of the sphere to a point where the potential is basically zero, which is really far away. So the best way to learn how to do ionization energy is just to, well, do ionization energy. So that's what we're gonna do with this example here for a zinc atom. And we're gonna draw the situation first as always. So here we have a zinc atom. Now a zinc atom in its normal state has 30 protons in its nucleus, but it also has 30 electrons. So in its normal ground state, it is neutral and it has no net charge. However, 
to remove an electron or when you remove an electron, it takes one of those outside the edge of the sphere. And this is just an approximation. This is just a model. It is not super duper accurate. So don't freak out if you're a chemist and you say that's terrible, that's wrong, it doesn't follow any of the rules. I know, it's, it's an approximation. So when we pull that one electron out just a little bit outside of the sphere of the atom, that changes the internal balance. So instead of having 30 electrons, instead there will be 29 electrons, which makes the atom have an overall charge of positive 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So that's the charge that we're gonna use on our sphere is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19. Now back a few slides ago when we were looking at spheres, we figured out that the potential at the surface of the sphere was equal to K times Q over the radius of the sphere. So from this formula and the information we have, we can figure out what the potential is at the surface of the sphere. And that's equal to 9 times 10 to the 9th newtons times meters squared over coulomb squared. Sorry, my squared up there looks like an R. Let me fix that really quick. Do meters squared times Q, which is... 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs divided by the radius of the sphere, which is 0.14 times 10 to the negative 9th meters. That's in the question right up there. So if we calculate that out, we'll get the potential at the surface. And we type that in the calculator, you should get 10.298 so, and there's a five, so we're gonna run that to 299 joules per coulomb. So that's the potential at the surface of the sphere. Now, way far away, where we're trying to remove the atom to, way far away, potential is zero. So our potential difference, the from the point we end up at um, to the point we started at, minus the point we started at, that's the potential difference. It equals negative 10.299. Now to calculate potential energy, the amount of energy required to remove the electron, we're going to use the formula that potential energy equals Q, the charge of the thing we're moving, which is an electron here, times potential, or change in potential, potential difference. So we're gonna plug in numbers to that. We get that the change in potential energy equals Q, which is the electron, 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19, times the change in V, negative one point, or sorry, negative 10.299. Now something I did forget to do, which I should have done, is make the charge of this electron negative because negative, Electrons are negatively charged, so that should be negative 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19. Multiply that by the potential difference that we found, and you'll get the ionization energy required, which is 1.649 times 10 to the negative 10th joules. That's the ionization energy of zinc. Now, if you divided that by the fundamental charge, and got back to the negative 10.299, that would tell you this energy in electron volts. 10.299 electron volts. Now you may come across a question that might ask you how this ionization energy changes if you take away a second electron. And the only difference, you compute it the exact same way, but the only difference is that instead of 29 electrons, you would now have already, already having removed one and starting to remove another, go down to 28 electrons, which would make your total charge um, of the sphere, the fundamental charge, times two. And for every subsequent electron you move, the charge goes up. So ionization energy increases for every electron that you pull away. 
All right, and the last thing we gotta look at is the electric potential of many charges. So this is just taking a bunch of point charges and finding the potential due to all of them at once. And it's super simple to do because it's just adding them up. And all of this fancy equation looking stuff is simply adding. It says that the potential at a point is the sum of all of the potentials from point charges. So for each point charge I, this is like an index for iterating through the point charges. So it could be point charge one, point charge two, point charge three, whatever. The sum over all the point charges and the uh, potential due to each point charge is K, Q over R, which is the same thing as 104, four pi epsilon naught times Q over R. So you just find the potential due to each point charge and then add them all up. So we're gonna do a quick example for that. So we're gonna look at this point right here and find its potential V. And we're gonna set our uh, zero potential V equals zero infinitely far away, super far away, so that we don't have to deal with any sort of additions. Okay, so let's calculate the potential due to the negative point charge first. And we'll label this as charge one. So the potential due to charge one at this point here is equal to K nine times 10 to the ninth Newtons times meters squared over Coulomb squared times Q, which is the value of the source charge, negative one times 10 to the negative nine Coulombs over the radius, which is four centimeters, so 0 0.04. So all we gotta do is compute that. When you type that into a calculator, or you kind of mentally think about it, you'll get negative 225 joules over coulombs. And then we gotta calculate it from the other point charge, V2, this is two, equals the same formula, nine times 10 to the nine, newtons times meters squared over coulomb squared, that's K, times this point charge, two times 10 to the negative nine, and it's positive, so we leave it that way, coulombs, over the radius. So we gotta find the radius from this charge to this point. This is just a three, four, five Pythagorean triple. So I know that the radius is five centimeters, which is 0.05. And if you do that math, you get that V2 equals 360 joules per coulomb. So we're gonna take and add those two things up. We'll do the sum of all of the Vs, sum over I of all the Vs, equals the sum of KQI over RI, which is what we did. And that sum, is negative 225 plus 360, which gives you a potential of 135 at that point. So at this point, V equals 135 volts or 135 joules per coulomb. This is pretty simple. You just have to calculate several times, add it all up, not bad at all. And that is all of the configurations that we're going to calculate electric potential for. Um, so this is a summary and something you can refer to if you ever need um, just kind of all of these formulas gathered in one place. This first formula is the general formula for potential. Potential is defined as the ratio of potential energy to the charge Q at a given point. Remember the difference is that potential is a quality of the space and potential energy is a quality of this charge Q. For capacitors, we have several equations. This top one is about the electric field. Sorry, that should have a little vector symbol there. So the electric field of a capacitor is equal to the potential difference across the capacitor divided by the distance between the plates. So you can use this to find either the field from potential or you can find the potential directly from the field if that's what you know. The second formula is how to calculate that potential difference if you know the charge on the plate, the distance across the plate, 
and the area of the plates. So all of the like standard properties of a capacitor. If those are given to you, you can find the delta V. And this last formula is basically just a proportion. Um, this is the way that it's written in books and uh, I think on your formula chart. I would prefer to have it as the voltage to whatever point you're looking at divided by the total voltage across the capacitor equals the distance x to the point you're looking at over the total distance because that makes more sense to me that it's just a proportion but oftentimes it's written as that equation but really it's just for finding the potential across um across a capacitor but only part of the way through so if you started at one plate and went some amount through this would find the potential across that instead of across the whole capacitor up here we have the potential for point charges um, which is just kq over r it's super simple super easy to compute down here we've got conducting spheres um, and for conducting spheres the potential inside is zero when r and these should all be r's my bad r is less than the radius of the sphere so inside the sphere the potential is zero this is for conducting spheres insulating spheres we're not worrying about so much on the inside at the surface we call that uh v naught which is just means the potential of the surface that's where your r of the point you're looking at is equal to the radius of the sphere so you're on the surface of the sphere and then down here at the bottom is calculating outside of the sphere or measuring the potential outside of the sphere and it's the same as a point charge kq over r we use a big q to represent the charge over the whole sphere and you can also mathematically rearrange that if you want to know how go back in the video to where i did it um, you can rearrange to get this which tells you the potential based on the surface potential and the radius only. So if you don't explicitly know the charge, um, you can use this formula or you can go back and calculate the charge and then find the volt. Um, basically does the same thing. It's just a little more roundabout mathematically. And that's for anywhere outside the sphere. And then lastly, if you've got uh, multiple point charges that are contributing to um, potential, all you have to do to find the number for potential is simply add them up. Not bad at all. All right, well, I know that concludes a lot of learning for you guys. Electric potentials are one of the more conceptually difficult things. And um, there's a lot of different scenarios, a lot of different formulas. Um, but hopefully, you guys, this will help. I'm going to put this slide as an image in Google Classroom. Um, probably with some of my other summaries so you can kind of have the information consolidated. Uh, but please let me know if you need any quelp, uh, any quelp, oh God, any help or you have any questions um, or you need anything at all, please email me. Please let me know. Um, I'll help you out.